Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online worship service for Sunday, October the 6th, 2020. In the name of Jesus Christ, we celebrate this Sunday with millions across the world because this is Worldwide Communion Sunday. Now, the birthdays for the coming week are as follows. October 7th, Noah Avergus. October 7th, Bev Hartzell. October 7th, Deanna Kaufman. October the 9th, Lisa England. October 10th, Callie Coleman. October the 10th, Toby Tesh. Happy birthday to all. We have some prayer concerns. This afternoon, Doris called me to ask for continued prayers for Jay. There has been no diagnosis. He's very ill. Let's pray for Doris and Jay. I let Walker's sister, Wendy, passed away. I announced a couple of weeks ago about Wendy's illness. She lived in Toronto, Canada, and she would have been 86 today, Sunday. Pray for Ayelet and her family. Doug Lather is in the hospital. Continued prayers for Doug and Lynn. Mona Luff has some health issues. Pray for Mona. Pat Pluger has given me an update on how she's doing. She has slight changes of flexibility in her shoulder. She's taking each day as it comes. Pat thanks all those for their prayers, cards, and phone calls. She sends her blessings to all. Mike Barge's mother, Retha, went to be with the Lord on Saturday, September the 26th. As a separate concern, there are members of Mike's extended family who are experiencing health concerns. Pray for them. Now, I will not be here next week, hold your applause, but Sarah Klaus will do the announcements, so send her your prayer requests and concerns. And now, friends, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Please stand with me as we are called into worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. You may be seated. Let us draw near to God, confessing our sins to the one who is loving enough and powerful enough to take them away. Let us pray silently, confessing how we have failed to love God, our neighbor, and ourselves. And then together, using the prayer printed on your sheet, let us pray. Hear our silent prayers, O Lord, and hear us now as we pray together. Gracious God, who made covenant with our ancestors, we gather here today as a rebellious people. We want to act out your intentions for us, but we get sidetracked by the false glitter of the world. You tell us to honor creation, but we use other people animals, and plants for our own gain. You offer bread to every living creature, and we steal that bread from our brothers and sisters in the name of greed. You promise us new life, but we shrink back in fear, clinging to our death-dealing ways. Heal us, O Lord, lest we destroy ourselves and the planet. We need your healing presence among us, that your good intentions for all of creation might be fulfilled at last. You come to us, O Lord, in everlasting mercy. You come to us, O Lord, in eternal love. You come to us, O Lord, in perfect grace and forgive us. Amen. Please sing with me as we lift our voices in praise. Hymn number 384, Rock of Ages.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Our scripture reading comes to us today from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, not that I have already attained this or reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. This is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and these are the words of Jesus. You have heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So, when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> I want to share with you a story this morning. That's all, just a story. But I mean it as a gift, a gift from my heart, to yours. So here it is. Eddie Mutum stepped out of the hot, stuffy air of the factory and into the crisp October night and took a long, deep breath. Second shift was over and it was time to head home, but not without his ritual beer with the boys at the corner pub just down the way. His wife and son would be in bed, so for years he had stopped at the little bar on his way home and had had a beer or two, never more, with his 
friends from work. And it was a great way to wind down from the day, to relax so that he could sleep when he got home. Eddie liked working the second shift much better than graveyard. He had grown accustomed to the rhythms of the job. And so this night started just like all the other nights with a friendly drink with his workmates. And then the world exploded. A man in a black ski mask burst into the room, slamming the door against the wall hard enough to crack the glass. He had a gun in one hand and a paper bag in another as he approached the cash register at the end of the bar. He seemed even more frightened and nervous than Eddie and the other customers as they watched in tense silence. The gunman waved the pistol toward the bartender and demanded that he open the register and put the contents in the bag. The bartender hesitated and the gunman banged the butt of the pistol down on the bar and told him that he wasn't joking around. Well, the sound of the gun hitting the wooden bar must have startled one of the customers because suddenly the deafening crash of a beer mug shattering on the floor rang through the room. And then pandemonium. The robber swung toward the sound of the breaking glass and opened fire randomly into the crowd. When the smoke cleared and the sound of the shots drifted away, the gunman was gone and four men lay dead on the barroom floor. One of them was Eddie. Now Eddie's son, Ed Jr., was a teenager when his father was killed. He wasn't a bad boy. He didn't get in a lot of trouble, but you know, he was a teenager. He was a little wild. And so in the wake of his father's death, folks, knew, folks who knew the Mutum family were worried about Ed, and rightly so. They were worried how this would impact him. What had been up until then some fairly innocent, rambunctious rebellion was now fueled with deep-seated anger, as you can expect. Anger at the killer, the man who shot his father. Anger at his dad for not being there, for choosing beer over his son. Anger at the world. Well, folks in the small town that Ed lived in worried enough that the police chief asked the district attorney to keep an eye on Ed just to make sure that he didn't get himself into any real trouble since his father was gone. Well, the years passed, and with the quiet and discreet assistance of the DA, Ed never had a clue that he was being watched. Ed stayed out of trouble, at least serious trouble, but he was angry, and that anger festered deep inside of him for most part, he could keep it tamped down, keep it under control, except when he drank, which was becoming more and more frequent. Eventually, the day came that Ed had to face his alcoholism. It had become full-blown, and he had to stand up and face it. He knew it was ruining his life, and to continue drinking had become nothing more than a painfully slow suicide. It was going to take his life at some point. And so he joined Alcoholics Anonymous and got his life together. He was still relatively young. His best years were in front of him. So he started looking around for a direction to go in. Now, you need to understand, Ed was a big man, and I'm not exaggerating. He was a really big man. He was six foot seven, 300 pounds, and he loved basketball. He loved basketball more than anything. He was too old to play at this point, but he thought maybe he could coach. Maybe that was the direction that he should go in. And so, against all odds, he landed a job coaching none other than the Harlem Globetrotters, if you can believe it. I mean, this opportunity, as you can imagine, was beyond his wildest dreams. And later, when Metal Ark Lemon decided to leave the Globetrotters and start his own exhibition team, he took Ed with him. And so for years, this is what 
had sunk his life into. And he loved every minute of it. You know, in many ways, Ed Mutem's coaching career was the stuff of legend. It was a boy's dream come true. But in the end, as you will see, it was only one chapter. One chapter in the life of a most amazing man. Out of his time in AA, Ed became a devout Christian. And he was very active in the Methodist church throughout all of those years as a coach. And so when he decided to retire from coaching, when his life in the basketball spotlight was over, it was really no surprise that God called him into the ministry. And when he decided to get a formal education, Ed chose the University of Dubuque Theological Seminary in Iowa. And that's where I had the deep blessing of meeting Ed Mutem. We were classmates, and I loved to hear those stories of his years with the Globetrotters. He was a big, had a big booming voice, just as big as he was, and, and he just seemed to blow into a room amidst gales of laughter. He always had a big entourage of friends and admirers following him around, but, but Ed himself was so genuine so down to earth, so accessible. He was just fun to be around. And one of his friends, one of his friends was an older, serious man. You would see Ed with him most of the time when he was walking around campus. It was another classmate of ours named Ralph Ames. And I share this with you because, as you will soon see, this story just gets more and more amazing. Because Ralph Ames, who had coincidentally received a call from God at the same time that Ed had, and had, again, coincidentally ended up at the University of Dubuque Seminary, Ralph Ames was none other than that district attorney that the police chief had asked to keep an eye on Ed when he was a teenager. Now they had lost touch and been away from each other ever since Ed had left his hometown. It had been decades since they had had any contact with each other. But now, here they were, both studying for the ministry at the same place at the same time. After all those years, and God was just getting started with his mysterious ways. Now, part of our training as seminary students was to serve as a student minister. It was usually for a small rural church not too far from campus. And Ed became the pastor of this sweet little country church that just absolutely loved him. And he was a great preacher. He really was. I mean, you can imagine. At six foot seven, 300 pounds, he certainly was quite a presence in the pulpit. And that big booming voice, nobody fell asleep on Sunday mornings, I can assure you. And one Sunday, one Sunday, Ed was preaching on the very text that we are using this morning, the very text that you heard read just a, a few minutes ago. And when he reached the part where Jesus says that you should leave your offering and go make amends, with your brother, when he reached that part in the text, he just stopped. He stood stock still in dead silence, just staring off into space. Now, at first, the congregation assumed it was some dramatic effect. It was part of the sermon, but the silence dragged on so long that they began to fear that something had happened to Ed. And you could hear in the silence of that sanctuary the creaking of the old wooden pews as people began to lean over toward each other and whisper, what should they do about Ed? And then Ed looked across the congregation, sweeping that small gathering with his tear-brimmed eyes. And he said, you know, I just realized something. I just realized that I have been deeply angry 
at someone for more than 30 years. I have never forgiven the man who shot and killed my father. Well, more than anything, Ed wanted to take Jesus' advice literally and step out of that pulpit and go try to make amends, but he pulled himself together and stumbled through the rest of the service. But he and the congregation were deeply shaken. That afternoon, Ed got home, and he gave Ralph a call, and they came up with a plan. Ralph made some calls and and found out that the man who had shot Ed's father was still spending time for those murders. In fact, he was incarcerated in a penitentiary not far from Dubuque, not far at all. And that's how the most miraculous chapter of this story began to unfold, because Over the next few weeks and months, Ralph and Ed were able to arrange several visits with that inmate. And it wasn't easy, as you can imagine, wasn't easy for everyone involved. But eventually, through that one-on-one time, Ed was able to make his peace with the man who had killed his father and forgive him. Finally, this is no small feat given the years and years of anger and bitterness that Ed had carried around with him. But even more miraculous, within those dim lit walls of that prison cell and through the words and tears of the two men whose lives were forever changed in a split second of panic, the light of Christ began to glow. And Ed was able to lead that murdering thief to the foot of the cross. The power, the power of what Ed did, the love that he extended to that prisoner who had never been able to forgive himself for what he had done so many years ago. It opened a door and it released the dark, pent-up feelings that they had both been carrying around with them for most of their lives. And it also allowed God's light and grace to fill their being. Such is the power of God's love. Amen. Let us join together in affirming our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
face of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for me than me, harder than my scope of my transgressions, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. Now yet I have been pardoned, to the torn asunder, giving me liberty. Oh, the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Harder than the scope of my transgressions, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise transforming power, making me God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. This is World Communion Sunday. And if you'll remember last year, Lou Shell brought to us and shared with us a wonderful collection of prayers from all over the world. They had been gathered by the Iona community in Scotland, but they came from all parts of the planet. And they were so beautiful, and it's been a full year, I thought it would be nice to share some of them as our responses and also as the benediction. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, God, of majesty and splendor. By your power, you created all that is, making a universe out of chaos. 
and ruling over all things in love. Throughout the ages, you called your people to love and serve you and to be your light among the nations. When we failed you, you did not fail us and sent prophets to call us back to your ways. We praise you that in the fullness of time, you revealed your love by sending your son, Jesus, to be the light of the world. He came to heal our brokenness and to set before us the ways of justice and peace. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Let us pray a prayer from the American Indian tradition. Lord, make our hearts places of peace and our minds harbors of tranquility. So in our souls true love for you and for one another, and root deeply within us friendship and unity, and concord with reverence. So may we give peace to each other sincerely and receive it beautifully. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He was born to dwell among us, full of grace and truth. In him we have seen your glory. Baptized by John in the Jordan, he lived for you, spoke your truth, showed your love, and gave himself for others. In his death on the cross, he overcame death. Rising from the tomb, he raised us to eternal life and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this fruit of the vine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Let us pray together a prayer from the church in Ghana. O Lord, our God, listening to us here, you accept the prayers of our sisters and brothers in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, the Americas, and Europe. We are all one in prayer. So many weep. Rightly carry out your commission to witness and to love in the church and throughout the world. Accept our prayers graciously, even when they are somewhat strange. They are offered in Jesus' name. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world, Illumine our hearts, O God, with the radiance of Christ's presence, that our lives may show forth his love in this weary world. Teach us to befriend the lost, to serve the poor, to reconcile our enemies, and to love our neighbors. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, And we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us now pray to our Lord Jesus Christ as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night of his arrest, took bread and after giving thanks to his heavenly Father, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the bread of life. And then in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant. It is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, every time we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we do proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. Let us pray. Everlasting God, the radiance of faithful souls who brought the nations to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Fill the world with your glory and show yourself to all the nations through him who is the true light and the bright and morning star, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please sing with me as we lift our voices in praise. Hymn number 354, Just As I Am.
May the blessings of light be on you, light without and light within. May the blessed sunshine shine on you like a great peat fire, so that stranger and friend may come and warm himself at it. And may the light shine out of the two eyes of you like a candle set in the window of a house, bidding the wanderer come in out of the storm. May the blessing of the rain be on you. May it beat upon your spirit and wash it fair and clean and leave there a shining pool where the blue of heaven shines and sometimes a star. <laughs> 